Welcome to On Top of the Covers, a weekly podcast by Orlove, dedicated to all of you amazing people, the creative visionaries and the entrepreneurs and the artists, the makers, disruptors around the world. I say people who are just like, you know what, I'm different. I want to try doing it completely different. We love you. We totally get you. And we feature a lot of inspirational stories of people contributing to the culture of music, specifically how they do it and creatively, artistically, personally, professionally. And in this day and age, there's so many different ways to do it. So uh, we love talking about these, or at least having these kinds of conversations. I'm Matt Gottesman, your host and director of the Oral of Brands. You guys can always reach out to me at Matt Gottesman on Instagram. You guys know for like the last eight, nine years, nearly a decade, I answer each and every single text and DM um, and happy to talk to you about what we're doing here uh, with Orlove and with On Top of the Covers. Also, as we say all the time, you know, music, this, the concept of music is really one of the biggest connectors in the world, right? It's this common bond. And we want to open up the conversations around the art and the contributors and the missions, because really, there's just a lot of unconventional ways that things are being done and, and different paths to success. And, and that's what we like to, uh, to feature. So we're going to dive right in. I uh, have another amazing guest, Ari Herstan. He's an entrepreneur and founder of Ari's Take Academy. He's also an author. And he's got over 3,000 students from around the world, wrote the number one best-selling book on music business in the world, how to make it in the new music business, which pretty much everybody that listens to our uh, our podcast at this point <laughs> probably has heard of him. They're like, finally. So um, he's really the poster child of DIY music, as was said by Forbes. Uh, and as I mentioned, CEO and founder of the music business education and um, artist advocacy company, Ari's Take. He started in 2012 as a blog. You guys know how I feel about this because that's how a lot of think great things start. And he's become the go-to resource for independent musicians on how to run a successful music career in the new music business, emphasis on the new. Um, and I was just telling him before the show uh, so much of what I've been feeling for a decade or two. And he's also the author, as I mentioned, uh, How to Make It in the New Music Business. Um, it's still the top of Amazon charts. It's been widely adopted by music business classrooms worldwide. Uh, it's well-researched, relatable. There's, it's a very no BS approach as to why many musicians continue to trust him for advice. Uh, he offers encouragement without uh, condescension and maintains a we're all in it together attitude not found anywhere else in the space. Amen. In 2018, um, he launched the online school, Ari's Take Academy, and it brings in experts in the field to teach courses on running successful careers in the new music business. So definitely go check that out. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about it here on the show. He's also the host of the popular music business podcast, The New Music Business, where he interviews innovators and experts in the music industry. So I completely relate to him. And uh, as an independent musician, he's played over 700 shows around the country. He has opened uh, and toured with Ben Folds, Cake, Matt Nathanson, The Milk Carton Kids, and Ron Pope. He's performed on Ellen, and he has had his music featured in countless TV shows, commercials, and films. Uh, he's everywhere. <laughs> he's basically everywhere. <laughs> he currently leads the funk project uh, based Brass Roots District. And he's written also for many top musician trade magazines and websites, including Music Connection Magazine. I remember that was one of the first magazines uh, I got way back in the day. American Songwriter, yeah. Digital Music News, Playback Magazine, CD Baby, TuneCore, Reverb Nation, Roland, Disc Makers, ASCAP, uh, Hypebot, and others. Um, so he's everywhere, like I said. <laughs> and he's been featured speaker at South by Southwest, BBC's One Amplify, ASCAP Music Expo, SF Music Tech, CD Baby's DIY Musician Conference, and Berklee College of Music. And most recently, he was one of the co-founders of the Uncanceled Music Festival, a live stream festival launched where mere weeks after the COVID live music shutdown, and the festival presented over 150 shows and raised 100,000 in 10 days for musicians and venues. Amen. He's also co-founded Independent Music Professionals United. Uh, political advocacy organization and helped write the cleanup bill that got California music professionals exempt from the gig worker law AB5. You're a busy man. <laughs> Welcome, man. I, 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 really appreciate, I really appreciate having you here. What, a, what an incredible background and with incredible experience that has probably spanned a couple, at least a couple of decades at this point or more. <laughs> so, yeah. Thanks for having me, um, man. It's I haven't heard my my bio read to me uh, in quite some time, and and uh, yeah, it's uh, it seems that that I I can't just stick to one thing. I'm I'm constantly bouncing around. <laughs> I guess I just go where the passion takes me. 
Well, I appreciate that. And I preach that often because we're really not just one thing that, mm -hmm. and I think that, you know, old paradigm, old, you know, society to say, you will follow this one path and that is all right. that you will be. And it's like, no, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I can use my skill sets to help out different, different passions. Right. So totally. So typically what we do uh, before we dive into more of the journey in your background um, sure. is we, we like to do the rapid fire questions. Um, we like okay. to do them up front uh, because it's different and uh, I never like doing anything the same as anybody else. <laughs> so, All right. so with that being said, we're going to go through four questions. It's been absolutely fun doing this with everybody and finding out um, similarities <laughs> and a lot of differences, but a lot of similarities. So the first question. One of my favorite ones, which is if all music was just about to be wiped from the face of the earth, Armageddon mm. was just only going to take the music away. But you could save three albums for you that you could only listen to for the rest of your life. What would those three albums be? Oh, good question. Um, if I was at home, I would probably pull out the vinyl records and, and show, pull them up on the on the screen. I'm, I'm a vinyl collector. Um, well, let's see. Some of my favorite albums of all time. Um, I'm going to I'm going to start with the Dave Matthews band uh, mm. Crash. That is uh, I, I kind of one of the reasons that I became a musician and, and a guitar player was uh, because of that band. And, and I played drums as well. And I played trumpet. And, and so uh, that's one of my favorite records. Um, go with Death Cab for Cuties plans record as well. And then Bill Withers, one of my favorite artists, songwriters, singers. Uh, I'm going to go with his his album Menagerie, uh, lesser known rel, uh, record, but it's a it's it's a a funk record of his, firmly planted in in the mid 70s, and and I love that one. So I'm I'm going to stick with that. I love it. I love it. Great choices. Um, number one and number two sometimes go together because uh, mm -hmm. question number two is name an influential person living or non-living that if you can mm -hmm. interact with for one night who would they be and i always tell people you can go back to like einstein and you know or leonardo da vinci or sometimes people say the the actual artist uh but it can mm. be any anybody you want somebody that you would sit down with for one night and talk you know, it would be Bill Withers. Um, mm. I saw Aloe Black interview him uh, on stage at wow. the ASCAP Expo uh, about five years ago. Um, you know, sadly, we, we lost Bill um, about a year ago, I believe, a year and a half ago. And and uh, he's such a warm energy and warm presence and just, uh, a, just like a, a down to earth uh, human, but with such so wise and has so much history and just an incredible life uh and i would i would love to just pick his brain for a night and just shoot the shit and and smoke a jay so that would be someone that i would probably love to have uh hung with and and um uh, yeah which would inevitably lead to even deeper conversations of course yes. too <laughs> <You know? laughs> of course mm -hmm. so uh okay great number three in your opinion what's the best music focused film of all time for you and when i say music focused mm. it can be a documentary or a docuseries or it could be a fictitious movie you know it doesn't have sure. to be real but you know music is its central theme which what would be your favorite <laughs> I mean, it's my favorite movie of all time, and that's Almost Famous. Uh, mm. That's an easy one for me. <laughs> Perfect. That's uh, you're only you're only the second person to bring that one up, um, uh. and and the same passion, the same exact passion is like there's no there's no other basically. Yes. <laughs> so yes, yes, incredible. Um, outside of your book, <laughs> what's an important book, podcast, mm -hmm. Audible platform that's helped you navigate your creativity and passion? You know, and it could be an author. It could be like a, you know, a YouTube series. It could be anything. But sure. Like, what's really helped you with your creativity and passion? Um, I, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to uh, list a few if that's OK. Please. Um, yeah. So for for books, let's start there with with just books. Um, Derek Sivers wrote a great book yes. called uh, Anything You Want, and he actually wrote the foreword of, of my book. Um, he is one of those uh, guru thinkers out there, uh, one of my mentors, and I, I love that book. I encourage everyone. It's a very quick read. I've read it mm -hmm. like 12 times. It's so easy and quick uh, and listen to the audiobook. I would also say uh, for any artist out there, uh, especially musician, uh, Victor Wooten, he's a bass player. Uh, he wrote this book called The Music Lesson. And it just that really cracked my mind open uh, in terms of how to think about music and connecting with an audience and just the the 
the reason that that artists pursue art, which is sometimes uh, a very challenging concept for anybody to grasp, especially artists uh, themselves. And then, um, and uh, Amanda Palmer, uh, her book, The Art of Asking, is also mm. she's she's also uh, in the DIY space, and you know she famously uh, had the most successful Kickstarter of all time at one point two million dollars for her music. I should say most successful music Kickstarter of all time. She also now currently uh, makes over fifty grand a month on her Patreon. She has been very in, inspirational, uh, just her teachings and the way that she has structured her career. And so, the art of asking is her book that she kind of talks all about that. Um, in the podcast space, uh, I would encourage people to listen to Verite's new podcast called "The Anatomy of an Artist." She just launched that a couple of months ago. I've been really digging on that. Uh, so, yeah, these are these are uh, it's a great question. Those are some great resources, um, especially uh, you know when you were bringing up you know artists pursuing the art, but. Mm -hmm also having to manage their art like a business. Yes. Um, and I think that there's there's that part that, um, you know, you either get it managed by other people, and, and this isn't anything in life, uh, your skill can get managed by other people, and you may mm -hmm. not always like the outcomes, mm -hmm. or you can learn to respect the beautiful art or, or skill set that you have and manage mm -hmm. it, and then you gotta learn all the business stuff that comes with that, <laughs> you know? Absolutely, and then we the all art... learn that the hard way, one way or another. Uh, right? we, we, every artist has that reckoning at some point. Some people have it right away early on, some people it's 10 years, 20 years down the line when they can't figure out why things aren't really working. And uh, mm -hmm. so everybody comes to that realization at some point. I, and I, amen, and I hope people get there sooner than later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because yes. I'm like, yes. it hurts a little bit less if you get there sooner. Or, totally. you know, look, no matter what, as long as you get there, right? But, uh, yes. and then Derek Siver is great. And then, yeah, the art of asking. Uh, I mean, yep. these are great resources, so. Um, yeah. this is perfect segue. Um, well, I wanted to talk, you know, about this concept of DIY musicians, gig economy, mm -hmm. um, the, you know, uh, we all have the ability now to own what we do and we have to build it and we have to think through how we build it. Um, yes, we still have to be strategic and honor what we do. Um, and there's so many tools and so many resources at, um, our, our call now. Mm -hmm. Um, but before we do so, I would love for you to, to, you know, give the audience a little bit about the background. You can go as far back as you want. Um, but how do we get here? Uh, and what was, you know, what was part of that journey that would never be able to be expressed through the bio that I did? Uh, of, of mine or, or as the yeah, state of, of the industry? Oh, no, okay. of yours, but I'm also, cool. you know, because I believe that you're probably going to talk a little bit about the state of the industry along <laughs> sure. the way, which is exactly, yeah. it's exactly why. <laughs> They're intertwined. And, and, and yes, actually, they are. it is the, the <laughs> reason that I am where I am in my career and the way that I've structured my career uh, in this way, uh, and, and, you know, focus so much on the new music business has so much to do with the intersection of where my career, uh, and business landed and, and my music landed when it did. And when I came out with it, so, you know, I, um, initially I went to college, uh, the university of Minnesota for one year as a, as a music education, uh, and, and classical trumpet major. I thought I was going to be a high school band director um, because in, in, in high school, you know, I, I knew I loved music, but I was told there were only three possible career choices in music. When I was in high school, my guidance counselor and everybody else was like, you have three choices for to pursue a music career or a career in music. One, you can be a classical musician. Two, you can be a music teacher high school or whatnot. Uh, and three, you could, you could work in music therapy. And the reason that these were the three choices is because these were the three majors that were offered at most universities that my <laughs> guidance counselor was familiar with. <laughs> so I'm like, well, if those are my three choices, uh, I'm not, I, I don't really want to be a classical trumpet player. Trumpet was my instrument. And I guess I'll be a, a band director, I suppose. So I went to school to do that. I realized very quickly that that was not uh, my calling and what I, I needed to do. Uh, I started performing acoustic shows around campus and realized, uh, and I was writing a lot more uh, solo kind of singer songwriter stuff. And I realized that was my calling and I needed to pursue a, an original uh, performing, performing career. Um, so I initially told my parents I was dropping out of college to become a rock star. That didn't <laughs> jive well with my, <laughs> uh, my, my highly educated Jewish parents. They, they were, that's every, every parent's uh, worst nightmare. So we compromised. We found a music industry school also in the Twin Cities. Um, I transferred there, studied songwriting and music business. It was a quick just uh, 
uh, three semester thing I did. Um, but this was 2005, mind mm -hmm. you. So just to just to get the landscape of where we were at, all my music business courses uh, were more or less about the history of the music industry. Exactly. Just to lay the groundwork of what was happening in 2005, Napster had, had pretty much decimated the recording music industry iTunes had just launched. So, you know, CDs were, were plummeting. CD sales were plummeting. iTunes was just getting off the ground. Facebook was still contained to universities. MySpace was just beginning and was kind of all the rage. This was pre-YouTube, pre-Twitter, pre-Instagram, pre-all of that. So once I got out of school, I realized uh, very quickly that everything I had been taught uh, was pretty much outdated and irrelevant. I mean... Case in point, they told me the only way that you can have a music career is you have to get signed to a record label, preferably a major record label. So I was like, all right, I graduated college. I'm like, all right, I'm ready to start my music career. Where's my record deal? Where's my deal? Because they didn't teach you how to get the deal. They're just like, no. you need a deal if you want a music career. I'm just like, all right, well, I want a music career. Where's my record deal? And that was it. Like I spent all this money <laughs> on an, a music business education and I was reading all the music business books out there at the time. And every, nobody said how to get the deal. Everyone was like, you need a deal. I was like, all right, well, I guess I could sit around, twiddle my thumbs, wait for this magical record deal to land in my lap, or I can just pursue and do what I love to do, which is play shows and make music. So that's what I did. And I, you know, figured things out the hard way. I, I booked a show Nobody showed up. I'm like, huh, why didn't anybody come to my show? And then I realized, well, I guess I didn't tell anybody. I didn't really promote it. And I'm like, well, uh, first lesson learned. I got to promote my show. So then I booked another show. I promoted it and people showed up. I'm like, huh, that was a good lesson to learn very <laughs> early on. So I kind of built my music career, you know, fast forward uh, about five years and I was selling out venues in a five state region. I was touring the country. I had songs placed on TV shows and, and commercials and movies. You know, I charted on iTunes, uh, all of this as a completely DIY independent artist. I didn't have a record label. I didn't have a manager. I didn't have a booking agent. I booked all Amen. my shows myself. Uh, you know, and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I just, and that was the thing is just because like, I didn't really want to sit around waiting for people to do stuff for me. Yes. I'm just like, you know, <laughs> if I want something to happen, I'm going to make it happen because yes. no one is going to do it for me. And I realized quickly that no one is going to care about my music career as much as I do. So if I want something to happen, I'm going to have to make it happen. And then you know, I moved out to LA. I kind of reached the ceiling. I was in Minneapolis. I reached my ceiling there. Um, I was selling out all the venues that I, I wanted to there. I was bringing about 800,000 people to my shows in Minneapolis. It was great. I felt really good, but I saw this trap. Everyone in that, all my friends' bands in Minneapolis, they would get really big and then they would tour. Nobody would come to their shows outside of Minneapolis. It was Minneapolis is kind of this island and very few people would actually break out. It was kind of like you reach your ceiling and then you essentially most bands would break up. And a lot of my friends bands were breaking up because they couldn't figure out how to make it work. They couldn't figure out how to actually make a living outside of Minneapolis playing these live shows. And honestly, that was heartbreaking to me because these were some of my favorite bands honestly, of all time. And I was playing shows with them and listening, loving their music. And because they couldn't figure out how to make it work, they couldn't figure out how to make a, a career happen, or they got signed, taken advantage of, and their career destroyed by a label. And they uh, signed a bad deal. Well, all the deals were bad then. Um, so, you know, I uh, moved out to LA. And uh, after some time, you know, I essentially was getting all these questions from musicians all over the country. Uh, like, how are you doing this? How did you, how did you book these tours? How did you get your songs placed on TV shows? How did you do all that? And I would get back to everybody. I would try to, and eventually word spread. If you have questions about the music business, go ask Ari. So then my inbox got flooded and I just, I didn't have time to respond to everybody, but I was seeing the same questions pop up over and over again. So I just like, I started this blog and like, you know what? I'm getting all these questions. I'm learning as I go. I don't claim to have all the answers, but I have some of them because I figured them out the hard way. So here they are. And, and when people would write it in, I'd be like, oh, I actually wrote about here. Go check out this article. Or, oh yeah, I wrote about this one here. Or, oh, you know what? I haven't actually written about that one, but I just discovered this last night and I would write about it. 
So because there really wasn't a blog out there geared towards musicians, working music professionals, other than ones written by companies looking to gain customers, because I, I wasn't looking honestly for anything. I wasn't, it wasn't monetized. There were no ads on it. I wasn't, I had no services. I wasn't charging for anything. It was literally just a resource for the music community to share information. So, you know, I don't believe in competition in the music industry. I believe a rising tide lifts all ships. And I wanted to just share the knowledge and information, anything I learned, I wanted to get out there. And I didn't want to see musicians get taken advantage of or screwed over by the industry. I was so many of my friends were, were just like being taken advantage of by, by predators and signing bad deals or just like people when they just don't know any better and they didn't have the knowledge. I'm like, all right, if I can at least empower you with the information and the knowledge, like hopefully you won't make these bad decisions that will be detrimental for the rest of your career. Uh, so the blog kind of took off. I got asked to write for other publications. Um, and then, you know, it turned into the book deal. And then uh, the book now in its second edition, um, I, you know, I'm trying to keep that, that book updated uh, every three years or so. And then, yeah, I, I honestly, it's just like, wherever I see there's a void or when people come to me and say they need something or they want something, that's when I, what I try to provide it. If, if I, if I, if I can be of service and of use to someone, then I try to, I, I that's just, that been a natural progression for me. So like the blog naturally progressed into, uh, the book, the book naturally, uh, has progressed now into the Academy, the online Academy and everything else I do. It's just kind of, uh, been, you know, uh, trying to be of service. This was exceptional context <laughs> for, 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 for everyone. And also it, it, it's funny because it, it really related to me. Um, you know, I, I remember music focused schools, uh, like the one in Minnesota that you mentioned, um, mm -hmm. in 2002, I went to full sale in Florida. Oh, for sure. about, yeah. I went there for about three months and I was like, mm, this is, yeah. I, I picked up on what you were saying was, <laughs> well, because I, I already saw what happened with Napster. Mm -hmm. And I was originally, you know, I was, I was, I was right before that I was working with Virgin Records in LA and I was like the only kid that was like, this is the most amazing thing. And everyone was yeah. like, sure, kid. And I'm like, I'm in the wrong <laughs> arena. I'm like, this yeah. is not good. And I, you know, nothing wrong with full set. I just, I realized I'm like, oh, there's a, there's a whole new emerging paradigm, like, you know, that you yeah. saw that was going to sure. be coming. And I'm like, oh, okay. And mm -hmm. we're part, you and I, of that interesting group where We've been here since Napster to TikTok mm -hmm. and everything in mm -hmm. between. Yes. And so we've actually had to learn as we go along because we're at the at the inception mm -hmm. <laughs> of each mm -hmm. new thing. You're like, MySpace, got it. So we're gonna have to set up pages <laughs> to do this stuff. <laughs> Facebook. Oh, there's now groups. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, yeah. like Instagram, you know. So uh -huh. um I it really resonated with me when you're talking about that because and and, and which intersects the part of if we wait for people to bring something to life, we are going to be waiting much longer uh, yes. than anything. And it's hard to sit still when you can feel that burning desire to create when you, you kind of know a next move. You, it's yes. hard to sit there and not work on it, right? Yes, you're absolutely right. And, and that is the thing I, I think, you know, it's, it is an entrepreneurial mindset. Um, and I, I realize that not every artist uh, naturally has that. And so it has been kind of my challenge um, as now I see myself as an educator and essentially kind of a, a coach uh, is to find ways to help artists unlock that side of them because they have the passion and the talent for the art themselves. And I know that they're passionate to make a career out of music if they're coming to my resources. And so that has been uh, the, the exciting and interesting challenge is, is how to reach every person in the way that they need to be reached yes. in, in a sense of just not everybody ticks the same way. Not everyone is wired the same way. I realize how fortunate I am that I can flip on the art and go into a songwriting session. And then the next day I can flip on the business and just yes. work business. A lot of people don't have that switch that they can just flip on and off like that. But I realize I'm wired in, a, in an interesting way that's like, you know, I know that I can't do business for four hours and then try to do art 
if yes. I'm going to do art, I have to dedicate a day to art or at least start with the art and then move it. That's just like, everybody kind of has to figure that out for themselves. It's just like, how do you work best and what do you need to set yourself up for success? It's a, that's a very good point. Uh, hopefully you're, you're teaching that too in, in your academy. Um, because I had to learn when I love doing the media and the writing as a writer and mm. all of the content I love doing, oof. Well, on days I'm doing busy business and managing a lot of business activities <laughs> mm -hmm. to switch from one side of the brain to the other right. like that. I mean, there's times I can because there's a natural part. But honestly, yeah. you're I, I feel everything you're saying in, in mm -hmm. separating it. Like these should be your dedicated times or at least your most optimized times for these activities and yes. for these activities. And absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, I love when you're saying that you're wired different. Um, I think part of that wiring also if you know, you may, uh, if I may, is is there's a little bit of humility in there to say, I don't know what I don't know, but I'm mm -hmm. going to go learn it so yes. I can kind of honor what I'm doing and have a better understanding of of how to grow this thing that I really believe in. Yes. And I think when you employ that humility, that's then how, you know, we're able to get out of the ego and be like, I'm going to be this mm -hmm. big rock star. It's like, well, first of right. all, let, let's start with the basics. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? Yes. No, and, and you're absolutely right. And, and I think that's why other musicians have gravitated towards uh, my writings is, is primarily because I don't claim to have all the answers. I'm yes. in the trenches with everyone. I'm, st I'm still an artist. I just released an album last month and it was very, very difficult <laughs> to do. <laughs> it's not like it's easy. It's just, and, and honestly, it's not even that it's difficult because there's, there's so many things to do yourself. It was emotionally difficult. And I, and I was very transparent about that. And it's, it's, you know, devastating when you put a song out and after the first week, you have less than a thousand streams on Spotify. And that like Spotify now seems to be like this arbitrator of uh, who is worthy or not. It used to be the record labels and now it's like the Spotify editorial playlist in some capacity, but it's really kind of zooming out and remembering the why. Why mm -hmm. are you in music? Why are you doing this? You're not in this to get a million Spotify streams. If you just remember that, then you can kind of reset your mentality yes. every once in a while when you need to, because I think we get really caught up in what we're supposed to do. And so it's like, oh, well, I'm going to look at your Spotify numbers or I'm going to look at your Instagram followers. And like people like to throw their metrics of success at you when they these vanity metrics mean absolutely nothing right. at the end of the day. It's like people are like, oh, well, you know, you only have 10,000 Instagram followers, so you must not have a, a, a healthy career. You must not be worth anything. And I'm like, listen, I know people who have 100,000 Instagram followers and they have day jobs and they're miserable. So it's like, what are your goals and intentions? Like, what are you really looking to do? And that's why I like to tell people, it's like, you know, the most important thing that any artist at any stage of their career can do, whether you're just getting started or you're 30 years into it, is set goals set very concrete, I call them, we all know this, this term, like the smart, smart goals, goals, the, yes, exactly, the, the specific, the measurable, the attainable, the realistic, and the time-bound goals, these concrete goals, you know, what do I want to achieve specifically in six months? And it, it seems like a concept that can be uh, just like a, a, an exercise, or it seems like, it's, honestly, this is the most important thing, and, and too many musicians forget to do that, they, they chase whatever is the hottest yes. trend or whatever people yes. tell them they should do. It's like, oh, get on TikTok. Like, you got to be on TikTok. Da, da, da. I'm like, you don't have to be on TikTok. Like, you know, it's, it's what your goals are. I have friends who are making literally seven figures a year with their music who are not on TikTok, who don't perform live, and they don't have Spotify numbers. And, and like, you know, they might have maybe 50,000 total streams on Spotify. It's like, how are they making seven figures? And it's because... They're in a very specific niche of the music industry, pursuing something that makes sense to them. You know, there isn't just one way to make a music career happen anymore. Honestly, there are as many ways to make a music career happen these days as there are musicians. And that's the thing. Wow. There's there there's every single person listening to this needs to understand uh, exactly what you just said. And I when I teach digital strategy to people and thinking through, you know, I'm like the numbers and the vanity metrics and the measurements and all these things. 
I'm like, they don't mean anything, A, without a very solid community that you have a relationship with. You see it all the time. Yes. I had somebody, I won't say who it was, but uh, they're, they're a small account, but they, I posted a bunch of his stuff on my stories and um, he was like, I don't know what happened. He's like, I ended up with like 60, 70 new followers from you. And he's like from, um, you know, these other big guys in this particular industry who also have legit followings, they posted my stuff, but I never got that before. I'm like, that's because mm. I have a relationship with my community. It's a very yes. specific community that is hungry for all these different things. And mm. they take my word for it because they see me to your other point, the mm -hmm. authenticity of like, here's what I'm learning. I don't mm -hmm. profess to know everything, but as I learn this, let me be so abundant and share it with you. It may mm. save you time. It may save you money, energy, whatever it might be, all these things. And then you could go apply it. And then you feel like, oh, wow, like that really helped. And then they tell a friend mm -hmm. and then they all start following <laughs> and you become exactly. a community. So you, yes. you brought up some, and then the other really, really important thing you brought up is so many people are chasing like these numbers so they can be approved by the system that says right. you've got <laughs> millions of, of streams. I'm like, yeah, but this guy over here on Beatport or right. on Beat on Beat Stars is selling like, you know, 3,000 of his beats at $30 mm -hmm. for 90 grand. Right. <laughs> you know, and they're like, yeah. And I'm like, he did that last month. Right. You know, so I was like, you've got to be, you know, where where are you asserting your yourself and your niche and your time and creating these, you know, um, mm -hmm. And I'd rather have 10,000 engaged fans ready to purchase over 100,000 like crickets, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, Passive yes. followers. No, and it's right. absolutely. And, and you make a good point with that great example of, you know, beat Porter, beat stars or whatever. It's like, that's one of a hundred things we could talk about right now, right? how you could actually make money in music right now. But the thing is, is that it, there is no one size fits all yes. anymore. And so, you know, I could never sell beats on beat Port or beat, uh, beat stars because I'm not a producer. That's not my niche. That's not my thing. That's mm -hmm. not my design desire and that's okay yeah. you know but i could play house concerts and love that i can get songs synced on tv shows and, and know how to do that there, there's yes. like very specific niches and understanding your strengths and your weaknesses will help you know which avenues to pursue and it's not even just strengths and weaknesses also your desires and passions like yes. as an example you know about uh 10 years ago when YouTube was all the rage and was really hot and everyone was the, doing the YouTuber thing. Um, I had a lot of friends here in LA uh, who were YouTubers and they had, you know, millions upon millions of views and, and hundreds of thousands of subscribers. And everyone was saying, you got to do the YouTube thing. YouTube is where it at. You have to do I'm like, okay. Uh, now, mind you, at the time, I had a, a fine career, a uh, successful career, primarily playing shows, getting songs synced, and kind of I've, I've carved, I had carved out my career in the way that made sense to me. But everyone's like, all right, you gotta, you gotta do the YouTuber thing. I'm like, all right. So I teamed up with a couple of my friends who were YouTubers and was and like, this is the way to do it. You gotta collab with them. And so it's like, we'll do the thing. And I'm like, I took their lead. And it was like, Every day they had something else. Day one, you know, we pick the song, we learn it, we get in the studio, we record it. Day two, we start to film it. Day three, we finish film. Day four, we edit it. Day five, da 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 da. And it was this, this just crazy thing. By the end of the week, once we put the video up, I'm just like, one, I didn't enjoy the process at all. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, this sucks. Like, this is not how I like to make music or make art or create anything. <laughs> Uh, and two, I wasn't proud of the product that we did because they, I deferred to kind of how they were doing it. I'm just like, you know what? God bless you for doing the way that you know how to do and that you want to do. And I, I give you so much props for, for carving out this kind of career. I hated this and I don't want to do this again. And if I, if this is what a music career means that you have to do, then I quit. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. But I didn't have to do it. And that was the thing is this like I did that for maybe three or four times. I was like, this sucks. I don't want to do it. So I chose not to do it. And I have a fine career. And so I think, you know, TikTok is right now where YouTube was 10 years ago. Right. And it's like, yeah, there are people finding massive success on TikTok. Um, you know, virtually every artist that major label signed in 2020 broke out from TikTok. And, and that's totally okay. And I've spoken to a lot of these, these artists who have done the TikTok thing successfully. And that's wonderful. It speaks to them. They're really good at that. They're, they, they love creating those kinds of videos and that kind of content. Wonderful. But I also know artists who despise TikTok and it is like this block that they set up and they're like, if I have to get on TikTok, like it is going to destroy my life and everything that I, I do. I was like, well, 
you're not in music to do TikTok. Like you're in music because you are an artist and, and believe in and love music passionately and you want a, a career. I don't know if TikTok's going to be around in two to three years. Who knows? Nobody knows. It doesn't matter. Like you have to be proud of the career that you're creating and you have to pursue uh, what makes sense for not just your strengths, but also your passions and desires. You made an incredible point with TikTok um, as a staple for everything else, which is, and with YouTube, some people want to be there. And yes. that's a good feeling when you want to do it. If you feel like you have to do it, that's a problem. Yeah. I have found, and you're absolutely right. Like I'm, I, you know, I've got the other platforms covered and somebody said, I'm surprised you're not, you know, on, on TikTok more. And I'm like, I'm tired. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I do you, I was like, I podcast two, three times yeah. a week. I, right. I was like, I have this platform and that platform and that platform running business, doing these. I'm right. like, you know what? I was like, but mazel tov to everybody that, yeah. you know, that uses it and, and is doing exactly. really well on there. Like, I, 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 I want you guys to succeed using those platforms. There's so many different um, ways to do something. And I, and I like what you're, what you're asserting, I think is very important for people is to not feel like they have to do something because other people are finding success there. Because yes. to your point, when you were trying to force something with YouTube, mm -hmm. it didn't necessarily feel right. And we shouldn't stick with something if it doesn't feel right. We have to learn to deal with our guiding intuition, mm -hmm. you know, our soul and be like, some doesn't seem right here. It doesn't mean that it's wrong for you. I actually think it's really right for you. I just don't think that this is for me. I've got to keep moving. I got to keep moving. You know? Yes. Yes, absolutely. So, absolutely. And so here's a question I wanted to ask you, because when you were bringing up the Spotify streams and they no longer mean the same thing uh, in mm -hmm. this newer uh, music business paradigm as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they, they mean something, of course, and they're very yes. they're, they're great achievements. But in the DIY world, mm -hmm. uh, in the, you know, the Russ world and Illmind, produ <laughs> Illmind, who's one of my favorite producers of all time, I had him on a podcast. Sure. Um, They've been DIYing it since the beginning um, yep. in this new world where you can control much of your growth. It doesn't have to be high on the, the streams, per se. How do you foresee the artist taking back more of the control and not so they don't necessarily not only not have to not worry about the stream count in terms of Spotify, but I mean, you could even see like even with the, the use case of NFTs and, and what people mm -hmm. are doing there and saying like, hey, you know what? I've got my cool 10,000 followers and about. Right. Five of them are ready to five thousand of them are ready to purchase. I'm gonna mm -hmm. do an NFT. It's gonna be at a you know right. hundred dollar hundred dollar price point because this is what they'll have with me. I'll make half right. a million um, and I'll show up to a nice private show for all five thousand of them. <laughs> I mean, right, right, right. You know, yeah, no, and, and and that's a good point. Is really what are your intentions? What do you want uh, for your music career? Do you want to be? I, I mean. You have to define what success looks like to you. Yes. And that, that's the biggest thing is, is you know, so we're all caught up in uh, the numbers game right now because all the numbers are publicly listed on every platform. You see the stream counts, you see the follower counts, you see the monthly listeners, all of that. And so that seems to be a barometer for uh, a lot of people's idea of, of what is successful and what is not. When it really shouldn't be. I mean, it, it can be an indicator of trends. It can be an indicator. Honestly, there, there are people who have um, 200,000 listeners on Spotify, 30 million streams, and they can't draw 50 people to their hometown shows. They can't sell 50 tickets. Right. Right. That is the era we're living in right now. People with tens of millions of streams, tens of millions of streams. If you really think about that, like if you sold tens of millions of records back in the day, like there were not many people that were doing that. It was Michael Jackson, the Beatles. It's like, you know, but there are people with tens of millions of streams that cannot sell 50 tickets, five zero, because what's happening in streaming is, is these streams are not fans. These are not fans primarily listening to this music. So if you have hundreds of thousands of listeners or millions and millions of streams, sometimes these, uh, the, there are fans that are listening to you. Sometimes there's somebody that is opening a playlist, 
hitting shuffle and they're like, yeah, I want to listen to the chill out and relax playlist right now. And you know, these, these songs pop up that I dig and by these artists that I've never heard of. And so that artist could literally walk up to them in the street and be like, Hey, I have a show tomorrow night. Would you like to come to like, I don't know who you are. Get out of my face. <laughs> and, and then, but literally they know is that like, uh, that's been their number one played artist of the last month. And they had no idea because they love them on this playlist. And that's the thing. So that's the era we're living in right now. And so it's good to just have that reality check and understanding. So we don't get caught up in these numbers. You know, uh, for instance, like I just released my album just over a month ago. And, you know, I was not blessed by the gods at Spotify to get editorial uh, inclusion in the playlist. So uh, you, I didn't see that overnight success that a lot of these that some artists get when they get included in hot playlists. And boom, after two weeks, you have millions of streams. But what I did have was uh, countless messages from fans, primarily emailing because email is, is where most of my audience lives. Um, messaging, emailing me saying how much the songs affected them, how much the record affected them. I mean, this is a breakup record. And, and one person told me this whole story of how he just broke up with his wife of 10 years uh, three days ago and was just walking around town listening to my album on repeat crying, like as he's having this cathartic spiritual experience and the music is helping him get through this time period. And I... That is a that is a way to measure impact that yes. Spotify yes. does not reveal that. I don't know when I see a stream on Spotify, if that stream came from this guy who is having this cathartic spiritual moment with my music, or if it came from somebody who heard the song on a playlist and clicked skip after 37 seconds. I don't know how to measure that impact on Spotify. Nobody does. And so I would much prefer to be in the place where I'm at, where I have these people sending me messages saying that my music changed their life versus getting blessed by the Spotify gods and have all these streams and make, you know, a little bit of money on that, but have nobody know or care that this came from an artist, that this could be, you know, made by an algorithm for all they know or care. It's just like, it's faceless right now. So I, I think it's, it's really important to kind of step back. And there is no, again, there's no one correct way to make it in music. It's like, if you are doing something you love, supporting the kind of lifestyle you'd like to have, that's success, you know, it like you don't need millions of streams, you you don't need any of this stuff. It's just like, if you can make a living and you're happy, I think that's success. Amen. Amen. I, well, I love that. I mean, to your point, and I, I say this all the time is that uh, success is very arbitrary. Um, and we mm -hmm. often at times have, you know, mainstream media and other uh, outlets say this is what in society, this is what success is like. These are the right. metrics. These are the titles. Says who? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, right. Says who? Well, I'm glad that worked for you. But like, I'm right. pretty sure as an individual soul walking this earth, I have a different yeah. path and you do and you do and you do. And so I totally. think it's important to to touch into that. And the other, you know, when you were talking about impact, um, it's it's very real, actually, what you were saying, because I, I was thinking about how early on when I was first doing content, I remember I was at an event. It's your exact point. And uh, I was talking to a couple of people. I didn't know who they were. And uh, they clearly didn't want uh, me to be part of their conversation at that time. <laughs> and uh, I, and I was like, OK, I'll just, you know, step back. And then this woman uh, talks. This other woman says, oh, I love this person. I love this content. I love this uh, whatever. And I'm like, oh, what's mm -hmm. the content? And she's like, oh, it's this uh, online uh, publication. I was like, oh. Oh, that's me and she's like <laughs> oh my god oh my god and I was like wow like okay so yeah. it's just what you consume online and I'm irrelevant <laughs> right so, so it was, it was a lot a, of it yeah right a good, it was a very good lesson very good lesson mm. early on and then to your other point though when you really create community and have the face with it and all that other stuff um when people write you and say listen I had a rough day and I really didn't think I could go on and this is this is exactly what it's like. You knew exactly what I needed to hear. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I knew you because I know me and we all go through it. And now mm -hmm. we're having a different conversation. And I feel like that's what really sparks um, growth. Right. Yes. A different kind Absolutely. of growth. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I, I love it. So and then what other. Um, oh, so like let's talk about Ari's Academy. <clears throat> uh, sure. Ari's, you know, take Academy because mm -hmm. um, that grew from a blog, from constantly giving advice, constantly mm -hmm being in your most authentic self, which is, hey, yeah. this might work. Very Seth Godin. <laughs> like, I yes, love the book. Yes. This might work. Um, right. And uh, 
you know, and I'm, I'm going to express all of that to you. I'm, I'm going to be the person that jumps out ahead and starts trying to learn these things. And then, of course, I'm happy to teach, which I have always been a fan of that route um, mm-hmm. because it gives context to the people and say, oh, wait, I would be careful of this. Um, mm-hmm. Then at what point did you start the academy and um, how like what are some of the elements that you're doing inside of this academy um, for our listeners that are like, mm-hmm. I'm lost, but I know I don't want to do the traditional route. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So uh my book came out, uh, mm-hmm. the first edition right. came out uh, De- uh, December 2016. I was very fortunate. I mean, I had built up kind of this audience from the blog. So the book was being adopted pretty quickly and schools started to teach it beginning the next year in 2017 and 2018, more and more schools. Because schools were teaching this book, I got asked to speak at these schools. And, you know, when I would go speak there, I would sit typically... Uh, Sometimes I would go classroom to classroom and I would sit in the back of the classroom for the first 20 minutes while the teacher is is teaching. It's usually a music business classroom. And then I'd get up and give my spiel. So many of these music business classrooms and these teachers, what they were saying and teaching was so out of touch. It was infuriating because I'm like, these kids are paying tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands of dollars for an education. And these teachers that they're putting their trust and their money into have no idea what is actually happening in the music industry right now. And they have no idea how to teach it because they're not in it. They haven't been relevant in it for decades. Honestly, most of these teachers, if they were ever in the music industry, they were in it 10, 20, 30 years ago. So I'm having more and more of those experiences. And then also similarly, students, uh, young musicians would come to me after graduating one of these programs And they're like, hey, my song is blowing up on Spotify right now. Uh, I don't know, but I'm not getting paid anything. I don't know how to collect my royalties. I'm just like, wait a minute. You just graduated with a music business degree from a very prestigious university. You are $200,000 in debt right now. And you don't know the most basic of basic things, how to collect your royalties. What did they teach you? Like, what? And so, like, this is insane to me. I'm like, man, there's got to be a better way. So, I kept seeing these, these, these things happening. I'm like, you know, I am now, I, I see what people need. And I see that the traditional model of education is broken, it's not working clearly. And similarly, I'd have a lot of these, these people come to me, readers that came to me and said, hey, like, I've read your book. I dig it, but I need more hands-on guidance. Like I, I, I need some accountability. I need people to help me along, hold my hand through this journey. I'm just like, okay, that was the perfect convergence to realize that I needed to kind of create this hands-on online learning, uh, academy that would do it better than everyone else and, and provided a way for people to learn in a way that made sense in this day and age and, and actually taught them stuff at a fraction of the cost uh, that any of these universities are charging. I, I think it's, it's, it's borderline criminal what they're charging yes. uh, and they do not set their students up for success. Like what we do at Ari's Tech Academy, uh, not just what we're teaching you because we have experts, literally our, our instructors are people who are masters in the space. So the, the, the person who is teaching our sync licensing course, he's a hip hop artist. He's the number one most synced artist uh, ever. I mean, he has over 1,500 of his own songs placed in TV shows, commercials, films. I mean, everyone who's listening to this, I 100% guarantee guarantee you've heard his music. You may not know who he is, but you've heard his songs because, I mean, NBA uses his music all over. I mean, like all the NBA teams, when you're in the stadium, that's his music playing. All the trailers are using it. The movies are using it. Anyway, He's teaching our sync licensing course. Mm. He makes a very good living doing, he doesn't, he doesn't need to teach this course for the money. That's the biggest difference is like, he's teaching because he wants to give back. Yeah. Uh, this is Vo Williams is, is the instructor for that. And he's a genius and he is so gracious because he really wants to support the community like I do. And, and so we bring people in that are experts in the field that they're teaching specifically that course and but they want to give back and so you know currently uh we have five courses um and taught by actors in the space on live streaming on digital marketing on booking and touring uh all of that stuff 
Um, and so I, you know, we're just getting started, you know, we are uh, two and a half years into this thing. Um, but yes, I think the reason that people have responded and, and joined us on this journey and jumped into it is because they realize that the traditional system is broken. And, you know, it's, I'm very humbled uh, to hear the responses. I mean, every day we get messages from students saying that this has changed their life and that this is something that they have needed. And, you know, the next iteration and what we're just starting to implement that no one else does, uh, definitely not the major universities, is we are bridging the gap between education and the industry. And so for our sync licensing course, for instance, we are now having showcases twice a year for some of the top sync agents in the space. And we are, it's our goal to get every one of our students representation if that's what they want. So if they want a sync agent, we're going to tr set you up and put you, give you the showcase with these sync agents. And these are top tier premier sync agents. Most of them don't accept unsolicited material. And so we bring them in um, because we have the relationships with them. We know them. And we're like, hey, we're vetting these students. We're vetting these artists. We are, we are teaching them how to make it work, what the sync space is all about. And we're going to weed out the ones who aren't quite ready for you. But here's the cream of the crop. Here's the best of the best. Um, and most of our students are, are at that level. And then we're going to get them signed. And we're doing that with, with uh, touring. We're doing that with sync. We're going to be doing that with, with um, all of our tracks and all of our courses eventually. And, and we, we feel like we can completely change the future of music education. I, I mean, uh, it's amazing when you break it down all like that because uh, you and I have seen it. The traditional, I do think it's criminal, <laughs> the, 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 the educational system and, and the way it's set up, which I believe is also <laughs> having its breakdown publicly. Um, yes. But that's a different conversation for a different time. Um, <laughs> and so uh, because I had seen it firsthand, I mean, I, I, I eventually went back and got the MBA and not that I would never take away from the beautiful school that I went to, but I was also the only digital person there uh, <laughs> at the time. And they weren't teaching that in there. And it was very interesting to me because I'm like, you really don't see it, huh? And they're like, oh, well, it's a very small component. I'm like, a very small component. I was like, last week, so-and-so's government was taken out by, you know, Facebook. <laughs> right. A small component? Right. I was like, I'm, I was like, once again, I'm in trouble. I'm in the wrong room. <laughs> right, right. You know, right, right. Uh, nothing wrong with, nothing wrong with the program though. But, um, but sure. you bring up a very good point, which is, and because the old paradigm, again, the old paradigm is not the new paradigm. The new paradigm is very much like, hey, um, here's firsthand knowledge on what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, here's uh, all the different routes that you can take. Here are people who are also had to learn and do it themselves. And of mm -hmm. course they want to give back because they know the utter pain <laughs> that it sometimes has been to mm -hmm. navigate some of these waters. And it's like, oh, no, no, like I have plenty. I want you to not have to do that over there. I'd rather you have plenty too, because mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. the give back is we all need to thrive because this old way like will crush you. And if you yes. got really talent, I want to see you win, you know? Yes. And, and I know that that's a newer, I'm not saying that it's never been a mentality. It's just that it's a more newly accepted model that is being mm -hmm. preached by uh, this beautiful inner information age we live in. Um, because the yes. old paradigm was like, you will follow this only system and this is the only way to the blueprint and this is the only way to do things. <laughs> yeah. And it hasn't worked out so far for like this majority until it started moving into this like more of abundant mindset of like, hey, listen, this is what's working for me. Here's all mm -hmm. the different resources and how to use them. Make it work for you. Absolutely. In the age that we're in, living in right now, uh, you don't need, especially in music, you don't need an expensive degree to succeed in the music yeah. industry. And so that needs to be communicated to teenagers and their parents that if you do want a career in music, there are ways that you can have a career in music that don't require you getting a $100, $150,000 degree. Because let me tell you, you know, I don't know how many promoters uh, have asked for my degree when I asked to book a show at their club. Zero, <laughs> you know, like no one is asking to see your degree. So it's like, don't get a degree <laughs> for the sake of getting a degree. If you want a career in music, get the education to help aid you in, in creating a career, whether you get a piece of paper or not is completely irrelevant because no one's ever going to ask for that ever again, if you're in music. So 
it's really about what can you bring to the table, whether you're, no matter what side of the table you're on, whether you're on the business side or whether you're in the music, you know, as an artist or a producer or an engineer or a manager or a, a booking agent or, or anyone, publicist. So it's, um, I, we are seeing this shift. And I think, you know, with the pandemic, that, I mean, it was the first time where traditional brick and mortar uh, enrollment education, these enrollment institutions dropped, dropped dramatically. Of course, you know, kids couldn't be on campus. So that's why they're stopping. But I think a lot of people reassess. I mean, you know, fortunately, ours take Academy, we had our biggest year in 2020. Uh, because people were reassessing, they're like, you know, what? yes, they're at home, like, I want to advance my education. And I've been hearing about this. And I think this is the time to do it. And so it was, I think that kind of the pandemic just gave a jump start to what the future of education is going to look like. And it doesn't require sitting in the classroom with someone who hasn't been relevant in the music industry for 40 years. Amen. Well, and um, I feel like last year was such a great year for people to go. Yeah, I saw this a lot like. Oh, is that what you do? Oh, is have you heard? And I said this before. People are like, "Have you heard of this thing, Zoom?" I'm like, "You've got to be kidding me!" <laughs> <laughs> so we've been using Zoom since the start of our right? Academy for our, for our Q and A sessions, and then when the pandemic hit, <laughs> it just like exploded, and and now my parents are on Zoom, and we want right. to like, you know, we're doing Passover Seder over Zoom and all right. that stuff. <laughs> right, it's it's like, LA. Right. yeah, that's true. The last year, yeah, Passover was over, over <laughs> right. Zoom. Yeah, and it was, yeah. uh, but it's so funny when people are like, uh, is so is that what you've been doing all this time? Is that with the Zoom stuff? I'm like, yeah, no, but we've been using it since its inception. Yeah, <laughs> right. You know, right. the only regret, the only regret I have is not having Zoom stock. That seriously, it's like, right? It's a, oh it's, my gosh, it's a need that people like you and I know people are going to have, and yes. so yes, that was my <laughs> only regret. I was like, noted, noted. Just still right. on learn on that one. So yeah, yeah, amazing. Absolutely. What um, what do you guys have coming up? Like, what what are some things you're excited about that's coming up? Yeah, so uh, we just finished an open enrollment period, and so for the next uh, six months or so, we're going to be developing new courses. Um, and we we only open enrollment a couple times a year, so that gives us time to uh, really focus on our current students that we have. We're not in this like endless open enrollment cycle, and then also develop new courses based on what's needed. So you know, we're looking at uh, speaking of TikTok, we're looking at engaging uh, some of the experts in the TikTok space uh, to develop a, a course on TikTok. Uh, we are talking to people in the NFT space, uh, potentially developing some education around NFTs for those that it makes sense for them. Um, and then we're going to relaunch our booking and touring course because obviously everything has changed and, and we halted that, of course, last year. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, eventually, we're going to currently these are a la carte standalone courses for working professionals. So you take a course and our, our thing is that you can implement the strategies tonight, like immediately it's it's eventually we're going to move to kind of a track program where we can really step you along. And so we can cater to the teenagers that are looking at traditional universities and this can be an alternative for them, but we'll also always be there for the working professionals, no matter what level and age of your career that you're in. I mean, because currently our students range, honestly, in age from 17 to 70. I mean, one of our students that we got signed, actually probably even older than 70, one of our students we got signed to a sync agent in, in the last round of submissions, uh, I believe he's in his early 70s. He's either mm. in his late 60s, early 70s. And, and he is so inspired and invigorated right now by this. And he is, is, is seeing a, a whole new uh, career in his late 60s, early 70s. And so we want to be there for, for those people as well, but we also want to be there for the people that are just getting started to kind of help get them started on the right foot. And so, you know, they are, are years ahead of where everybody else was when you graduate and you still have no idea what you're supposed to do and you sign a few bad deals and then you wake up and you're 20 years down the road and you're like, man. I've made so many mistakes and I my I feel like my career now is just getting started. And it's like, well, let's save you those 20 years of, of hardships. I, I love it. And really two very important vital roles, helping everybody who's at the very beginning stages of their dreams that are, you know, um, uh, if I knew then what I don't, if I know, if I knew then what I know now, and so you're helping yes. them know now, mm -hmm, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then people later on in their career, which is, um, 
I need to adapt and do something different because there's a lot I don't know and I need to know more and I need to do better. Mm -hmm. And so you have, and then there's everybody in between, but I feel like they really falling into one. They're either just starting or they've been doing it and they're like, I need to do better. There's something I'm missing. And so I I think it's beautiful to be able to cater to both of those markets. Otherwise, again, it can be very painful, (laughs) you know, without it. So, uh, and dream killing. And, you know, I think instead, like you said, like here's somebody who's having a whole new life at, you know, late Mm sixties, early seventies and is like, oh, okay. It all makes sense now. It all can make sense now. You know, yes. so that's that's uh, very admirable. Um, where can everybody find out about you online, about mm-hmm. the, the Academy online, everything? Sure. Uh, Ari's take.com is kind of the hub uh, for all of the resources. Uh, so I'd encourage everybody to go there. Uh, my website is AriHerstand.com. You can go there as well. Um, you know, of course, I'm on I'm on Instagram and Twitter. That's at Ari Herstand. Um, and then Ari's take is also uh on instagram twitter and tiktok ari's take is on tiktok so if you want to find us there uh or wherever and then um yeah we put resources out on youtube uh we have the podcast the new music business podcast uh so however you like to consume your content uh we're we're here for you uh incredible incredible for everybody listening um ari's take.com that's probably the the fastest way to get to everything that you need. And yeah, I uh, just uh, connected with you on on Instagram, so I look forward to Amazing. relaying on the journey and whatnot. And um, cool, you know, I just it's been so great having you here. I <laughs> I can't tell you enough how because I, I, sometimes you feel alone preaching this stuff. You know what I mean? I mean I'm talking about <laughs> me. I've you, and and then more and more you're getting more and more people who go like, wait a minute. You're like, yes. <laughs> like so I'm realizing some I'm like, yes. <laughs> you know, it's like Yeah. Um and and because of the amount of information that's out there and and ultimately I want people to just thrive knowing that they don't have to do it any one specific way. Like, no, this yes. is a way. There's always more. And there used to be a thousand ways to skin a cat. No, no, uh, <laughs> not to, not to offend Peter, yeah. uh, but but there's but there's there's millions of ways to do something now. Yes. Um. And uh. And I just I love that you came on to really express and show like, hey, look, think very five dimensionally about all this stuff. There's a lot mm-hmm. more going on than than just the parts that you see. You know. So thank you for coming totally. on the show. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Sit tight. Uh, we'll we'll, we'll uh, connect here in a second. For everybody listening, uh, Ari's take.com for Ari Herstand. Uh, incredible. Check out there. You can go and, and, and learn about the Academy. If you guys are looking, if you're on the artist side or you're looking the music, in, uh, music industry business side, mm-hmm. reach out to him. I always say this, like, you know, there's a lot of tools out there to go reach out, find out more information mm-hmm. that you need. Uh, I would just tell people to be appropriate when you <laughs> people are very busy. So, you know, do your best uh, to, to reach out with respectfully. Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, thank you all seriously for tuning in on top of the covers. It, it means so much to us and the movement that we're trying to, to establish here in, in, in the contribution of music culture, uh, especially for a lot of the artists out there and the innovators. Um, there's so many new ways to do things. And this is exactly mm-hmm. the type of conversations we, we want to have for everybody. And also, thank you for everybody giving us the feedback lately on this journey. It's been incredible. Um, the five-star written reviews are amazing. Please continue to keep them coming in as uh, we're good without the metrics. But, uh, you know, Apple, though, does like to spread the awareness <laughs> with those. And so I always ask everybody kindly, you know, support the show if you wanted to help us continue to grow it. And you can also follow us on all major platforms at We Are Or Love. You can follow myself at Matt Gottesman on Insta. You guys know I answer each and every single text. So happy to answer your guys' questions. Um, also subscribe. If you're listening to the show right now on Spotify or Apple or iHeart or Google Play or Radio.com or any of the of the 30 platforms out there, you can actually watch this show uh, on our uh, Or Love YouTube channel. So be sure to go there, check it out. You can also comment there and we, we can uh, answer any questions as well. So appreciate each and every one of you guys for constantly tuning in. Thank you guys. And we are out. <laughs>